he accelerates businesses around the world. Looney Libis of Fledge, right here with us. You know, Looney accelerating businesses, how much fun is that? It's the best job I've ever had. Yeah? yeah. So what do you do? Um, well, I get to invite in a few companies at a time, generally seven, uh, work with them every day for 10 weeks and help them get from wherever they are to wherever they're going. But in that general space, from idea to startup is how I talk about it. Wow, that's fantastic. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Fledge, the company itself. First off, the name, Fledge. Uh, yeah, it turned out to be a great name, right? It totally fits what we do. We help companies just at that part where they're just about to fly, right? That's what the English word means. Uh, but it's really indicative of what we do, in fact, uh, as well, or what we teach. Hmm. Uh, and I got to the spot where you check on Google. Right? It's really important these days that when someone types in the name of your company that your company is found. I typed in Fledge. I thought it was a pretty good name, but I typed it in, and the first thing that came up was Wikipedia and some dictionary entries. And I said, "That's it. That's the name." Mm -hmm. Search results. It sounds like you just gave us some business advice. Uh, that's again. That, that's kind of what happens for ten weeks. Um, you find out what the teams need. You fill in those gaps. By the way, Fledge is in 2014 still an unusual form of business. You're a B Corp. Uh, certified B Corp. Yes. So uh, we are a for-profit company that is promised the world that we're trying to do things in a better way. We're trying to make the world a better place. Uh, and B Labs, who runs the B Corp system, has certified that uh, we are telling the truth. We've got to ask this. There's lots of people around the world who think that they're great business theoreticians and consultants. Why are you one of them? Uh, what I am is a 23-year serial entrepreneur. So what I have done for the first 20 years of my career was start companies one at a time, uh, all here in Seattle, all software-based. Uh, and then after 20 years, I figured I must know something. I had uh, started four companies, been part of five startups, and all but the first were still selling product. We're still up and running. Uh, and so I sat back and said, well, what should I do for the next 20 years? Uh, and the answer that came was, well, I should help the next entrepreneurs. I should help the next people not have to learn it the way I did, which was on the streets one at a time making mistakes one after the other, uh, but in fact being trained so that their chances of success are way higher. Why do that? Why help the world? Why not just go out and make your next billion? The idea of I'm going to make a lot of money and then give it away is not that old of an idea. That's actually invented by Andrew Carnegie about 120 years ago, 130 mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, he invented that model. Uh, and we see even Bill Gates has followed that model, and Warren Buffett and whatnot. Um, but there's this other idea that's been percolating around for decades that is just taking off now. And this is the idea of why don't you do business that does good in the first place? So that you can do good and do business and make a living and do good in the world all at the same time. Who is a potential fledgling? Uh, anyone with a good idea that makes the world a better place. Okay. Uh, that's, it's pretty broad. That right. is pretty any, Anyone, anywhere, in any, any market, any geography, any, uh, any field. All right, let's take a, a hundred of our viewers right now and, and the, the hundred that they, they believe they have a good idea. What do they do to file an application to become part of the program? All right, so pretty much any time there is an application open, uh, we're really not going to look at them until close to the application deadline, which is every six months or so. Um, but we get uh, over a hundred applications per session, right, twice a year. Uh, and then there's a deadline listed. The last time we did this, the deadline was the, like the last day of June. Uh, on that day, we don't accept any more. They all get looked at. Everyone who applies and finishes the application gets at least some feedback on, on what they're doing that could be better. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very clear view. So I, I personally read every single one of these. And uh, it's very clear that some stand out amongst the others. The ones that are uh, at the bottom of the pile, they get thank yous, they get some feedback, um, and we send them off. Uh, the ones that are at the top of the pile, they all get an interview. Uh, since they're coming from around the world, it's a hangout, usually, or a Skype call. Um, I like to see the people uh, eye to eye. From there, they get uh, ranked and, and follow-up questions get created. Uh, and then I reach out into the network that is Fledge. Fledge is not just me. Um, on paper, it looks like it's just me, but it's dozens and dozens of others that volunteer their time as, as mentors and advisors. And so in any given application, if it's a, let's say, clean tech application, it goes to the experts that I have in the, in the network that, are, um, that know clean tech. 
backwards and forwards. If it's in the medical field, it goes to the medical field people. Uh, any field, I always find someone who has some knowledge that can tell me something about that. Well, so what are the experts looking for? A great business idea? A, a great technology? What? Uh, three main criteria. Uh, first and foremost is team. Right? No matter what, even though it's social enterprise versus tech, it's still going to be a great team needs, needs to be there to make sure this goes through. Right? Ideas don't, don't, uh, don't create themselves. Uh, second is what's the impact of the world? So impact to the world. So how, how much is this idea going to make the world a better place? And it could be better for the community, it could be better for the country, it could be better for the whole world, uh, but better. Uh, and then third is uh, a uh, deep analysis of how, what are the odds of success, right? How hard is this problem? How much competition is there? How much money is going to be needed to, to get this off the ground? Uh, what are the likely hurdles in the way? Uh, and that third one is something that, uh, Again, me, my advisors, other entrepreneurs, we've seen the patterns and we can see what's likely coming better than the applicants. Yeah. And so we can make an assessment of uh, you know, how hard is this truly going to be for them? Where are they probably going to get uh, hung up? So of the 100 viewers that, that we had who felt like they had good ideas, they just said, hmm, I don't think I can do that. So we're down to 50 eligible ones. How much do they have to pay to come to you? Uh, it costs nothing to apply. Uh, we accept just a handful. Again, we aim for about seven per, per group. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we write them the check. You write them the check? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> now, I've, I've not heard of that. Were you writing them checks to come and take your course? Yeah, it sounds a little bit backwards. A little um, bit. So we write them a check on day one. Uh, last session, we handed out $17,000 checks on average. Next one, we're upping it to 20. Uh, and in this realm, we did not invent this model. In, the, in this model, that's the norm. Um, so we're handing them a check and we're giving them 10 weeks of service and in exchange we are asking for 6% ownership of their company. Um, 6%? So it's an investment, right? And rather than just handing over money like most angels would or small seed funds, we're saying, no, no, money's not good enough, right? Money and help will help you far better than just money. Wow. So right. for, so these businesses then, and so we, we've just got our, our 50 and they just upped it to 75 because all of a sudden when they heard, hey, you're going to write a, yeah, write or, a or check to me. Yeah. Or 99. Or 99, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so getting back to these very, very interested people, but then they have to give you 10 weeks of their life. Um, no, they have to come and work here for 10 weeks as opposed <laughs> to working wherever they are already. Okay, all right. So yes, um, but uh, most people do find the way to, to uh, to come here, most people who really want to get their businesses going find a way by hook or by crook to get here for 10 weeks. Now, they're not just from Seattle, they're from all over the world. All over the world, yeah. So um, I sus suspect that people from all over the world uh, probably need a place to stay. Uh, so they often ha find a, a place to stay for free, but uh, we live in a city of four million people. There are rooms for rent. Uh, it really doesn't cost that much to be in Seattle for 10 weeks. Hmm. Um, so how many uh, fledged sessions have you had to date? Uh, we're just finishing up the fifth session, and we've had 32 companies come through the system so far. Wow, 32. Yeah. Uh, do you, I guess if you have a, you know, an investment in these companies, then you're probably you know, keeping tabs. Yeah, every, every quarter we keep tabs on revenues and, and employment and a few other key statistics. So are you ready for your next billion yet from the, these <laughs> investments? Um, we're ready to do the next session next year, uh, and the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that. Yeah. All right. Now, let's talk about then what happens during the session. So uh, let's, let's say that we have seven accepted. Mm -hmm. And the seven people on the first day, what happens? Uh, so they come in, um, first day is, is settling in, finding out what the system is about. Second day is a uh, first day of class of entrepreneurship. So while they're here, there's really uh, three areas where they're getting help. First, they're getting an entrepreneurship class. It's the same class I teach to MBA students at Pinchot upstairs from here. Um, second thing is they're getting introduced to this network of mentors. We generally get about 50 people that come in and help. Each team is meeting 12 to 20 different individuals for a half hour, an hour to get their advice. Oh my gosh. Uh, that's really what, they're, what they talk about when they leave is access to that. Uh, if there's anyone else in town they'd like to meet or anyone else in the country they'd like to meet, we'll do our best to do introductions. Uh, so the network of network, right? So my network of people and then their network is vast. 
Um, is there a is there a single common request that uh, most of your fledglings have really early on, such as, well, I'm really looking for venture capital, or I'm really looking for knowledge in payroll or X. Yeah, um, what it seems to be is that to be a successful entrepreneur, to have a successful startup, you have to do a lot of things, and you can't miss any of them. And so the key to what makes a system like this work really well is A, they're getting a broad education in what it means to be an entrepreneur. So we're filling in the gaps of their knowledge. So even if um, one in four of the classes are unique and, and useful to them and three, or three of the four are not, they've still gotten that one out of the four they wouldn't have gotten anyway. Uh, and then this network of a dozen people or so that they've met are f also filling in their, those gaps and connecting them to people who could fill in those gaps. Mm -hmm. And so by the time they're leaving, they are a whole team and a whole, a whole plan instead of a kernel of an idea and a, and a possible plan. Is there a stereotypical fledgling participant? Uh, tends to be teams of two. Uh, we have on occasion done teams of one, right? That doesn't sound right, but teams of one, uh, aiming to be larger teams. Uh, on occasion we get a team that's already five or six or seven people. Uh, they tend to be prototype stage. So it's not just an idea and a PowerPoint, although we do work with groups that are just ideas and PowerPoints tends to be something that's already been launched in the market as a test. And then um, some of the fledgings that have come in have already had revenues, but we aim to like get them to the point where they have some revenues. We aim so that at the end of the 10 weeks, they're either making revenues or they have that plan to make revenues soon. Wow, you're talking about uh, a, a very, very young business coming in and you're talking about having, having them make sales by the time they leave, if at all possible. Yeah, so the, a, a key to the modern way of doing startups, the lean philosophy of startups, is find something to bring out to the market as soon as possible that you can actually sell. Hmm. And even if that's just a dollar, the difference between getting a dollar from a customer versus giving it to them for free is way bigger than the difference between a dollar and a thousand. Uh, I want to talk about the successes and perhaps successes yet to be, but first I want to go back to the mentors. You said that you, you have an awful lot of mentors that participate, including um, volunteers. Tell me about them. I mean, why would they give up their time? A uh, huge variety of reasons, uh, and I don't pry on why too, too often, because um, I'm really happy that they come. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but we have lots of professionals, uh, sometimes older professionals, and they too woke up and said it's time to give back and help the next entrepreneurs. Or current professionals who are you know, hoping for a little bit of business by coming and doing this, but if not, then they've gotten the pleasure of helping. Uh, and then there are some that come through, the uh, CFOs for hire and the, and the uh, accountants and the, um, and the lawyers that are really here uh, and really do wind up leaving with business. All right, so we have another group then of viewers and, and these are potential mentors. How would they become mentors? Uh, all you gotta do is, is email and say, I'd like to help. Uh, and I get an email like that at least once a week. Wow, okay, so that's easy enough. The email's up on the screen. Um, all right, let's, let's talk about something that's very, very fun because I, I got to watch a video of it and we're gonna actually be running some clips in the background. Let's talk about Demo Day. Uh, what is Demo Day? All right, so, uh, Near the end of the program, we take these fledgings, we put them up on stage and show them off to the community. Uh, and that has a bunch of different purposes. First and foremost, it's not so obvious. First and foremost, we're doing it to teach them how to talk about their business. So you, one thing you will not succeed at as an entrepreneur is not being able to get up in front of people and talk. So we've taught them how to do that. We spend three weeks of the program teaching them that skill. It is I mean, my gosh, if they're coming there with an idea, they're all bubbling with excitement, why isn't that easy? Uh, it's not. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not a skill that they teach in school. It's not a skill that a lot of people have. Some people do. Um, but uh, even when they're good at getting up and pitching, uh, for Demo Day, we're teaching them how to do storytelling. We're aiming Demo Day to be more like TED. Where we want to be inspiring stories, not just investor pitches. So we get them up on stage, we fill the room with people. Uh, they are a mix of investors and community members and potential customers and potential team members uh, and so forth. Uh, and we only give them six minutes each to get up. So the less time you have, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do their best. Six minutes on stage, entertain us, <laughs> make, make us want to do something. 
So is, is that really part of it though, the, the entertaining aspect of it? I mean, is that likely to get an investor or a customer? Uh, if you have an entertaining story, then you're more likely to get everything. Um, and your storytelling is about investors, it's about growing the team. Because if you don't have an exciting story to tell, no one's gonna wanna join your team either. And of course you need an exciting story to get customers. Now, some of the, some of the things that I have seen um, really look pretty polished. Uh, I mean, do people come to you already polished or, I mean, you know, and you just kind of hone them or how does that Out work? Out of 32, no, just a, just a handful of, or, or, uh, just a handful on day one could stand up and, and do a pretty good presentation. Oh, all right. uh, no one, uh, no one is, has a really good polished presentation for demo day on the first day of, of that. Uh, of that setup. What do you think you teach them the most? Uh, again, it's not, it's not the most of anything or anything deep. It's the broad, uh, full selection of, of uh, talents and skills you need to be an entrepreneur. I get the feeling that it's hard to be an entrepreneur. It's certainly not easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a fun job, but uh, uh, it's not like being a specialist where you come into work and you work on this one thing each day and every day and you get really good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, you come into work and you put on a different hat each day. How has Fledge, how have you changed from the first season to the most recent season? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, uh, I, I've been uh, exposed now to this, call it 32 times, um, and I see more and more uh, similar patterns emerging. Uh, and so as I see these patterns more often, they're failure patterns than success patterns. Mm, what's that, what are some of them? Um, I was warned ahead of time, don't take teams of one, don't take single, single entrepreneurs. Uh, they just don't move, there's too much to do. They don't move as quickly along, their chances of success are lower. Um, I buck that, that advice uh, and, and lo and behold, the teams move a little slower, uh, have too much to do and so forth. Um, uh, so I've learned from that one. Uh, I've learned a bit from taking in too many teams that are at the idea stage. Um, as we've gotten more and more known around the world, we've gotten uh, applicants that are up and running with some revenues now. And it's an interesting mix to bring in those and the idea stage teams at the same time and see how they mesh in between, mesh together. Are more of the ideas like tangible products or are they Software, you know, um, up in the air. What are they? Two thirds services, one third physical products. Maybe a bit more services. Mm -hmm. Services are easier to do. Which ones are more likely to be successful? That's too early to tell. Uh, that 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 I knew ahead of time. I mean, as much as we you know pick the ones we think are the best, as much as we work with them every day and and you know internally place odds, we don't know. Before we talk about the ones from this most recent season though, what are some of the ones that are the most memorable? I'm not going to ask you the question <laughs> which one's your favorite because I think that would be unfair. Yeah. But what are some of the ones that are most memorable? Um, a few that, that stand out in terms of what they've done since graduation um, would be Burn Manufacturing. So they set up a factory in Kenya to build cook stoves. And when they walked in, when I first met them, they were talking about raising a large sum of money to do that. Uh, I lost track now. It's about $5 million into that business. They have the most modern factory in Nairobi, as far as I know. Wow. Um, certainly the most modern cook stove factory in the world, uh, and they're producing lots of stoves. And on the total other end of the spectrum, uh, Community Source Capital, based in this building. I met them when they were grad students at Pinchot. I, I in part, created Fledge for them and graduates like them. Uh, and they um, had this idea just an idea when they walked into Fledge of a crowd lending platform for local businesses. So to fill in the gap because banks don't lend to small businesses anymore. Just that it rarely mm -hmm. happens. So why not raise money in the form of a loan from the customers of the businesses themselves? Thought it was a brilliant idea, didn't know if it was going to work. Uh, they went through Fledge, we then spent three months to make sure it was legal and then <laughs> launched the business. Uh, they're now operating in six states They've raised over half a million dollars for three dozen businesses uh, from almost 4,000 people. Wow. So it works. Wow, that's, that's right. fantastic. The question is how do we do a million people, but uh, yeah. that's the next problem. Do you have legal issues with regard to businesses often? Um, not very often, but it's not uncommon. 
Um, one thing that's different about Fledge is we take in teams before they're incorporated. So often we're dealing with incorporation issues. We take teams from overseas. So often we're dealing with um, what we generally call mini multinationals. Turns out that there are no laws to um, no laws to limit what small companies have to do if they're multinational versus big companies. Uh, so they, they have to follow all the same rules whether they're GE or GM or Apple or some small startup that's in a, in a tiny space in Seattle. Got to ask you this: Is, there, is this something that, that baby boomers are looking for as a second chance or a, you know a second career or fifth career? Uh, that I haven't seen yet. Um, what I have seen is that the average age of fledglings is about 10 years older than the average age in the tech sector. So when we see these kind of accelerators in the tech space, um, historically, traditionally, or, or um, uh, kind of the cliche is it's two twenty something, yeah, it's two twenty something year old guys. Um, and what we see at fledges is it's usually thirty something year olds, hmm. and they're usually half women. Half the, half the fledglings are uh, founded and run by women. Oh, well that's different. That's a little bit different, yeah. Is that an extra challenge for you? No, it's an, ad it's an extra... Um, advantage. Uh, advantage, yeah. Um, Fledge has a cousin, if you will. Uh, it's an online, because you can't be all around the world, right? Right. I mean, you, you appeal to people to come to you from all around the world, but you're not going you know, to multiple cities. There's only one the Fledge time. at the moment. Um, so we have a child called Kick. Kick. So it's a separate program run by the same organization, the organization that happens to be called Fledge. Uh, and Kick is a six-week part-time pre-accelerator program that we license to anyone who wants to run it around the world. Uh, currently licensed to 16 licensees in 14 cities, seven countries on every continent but South America. Wow, that, that sounds like an entire story all about all of itself. Yeah, and really short version of that is uh, I looked at the fact that we turn away 95% of all the applicants and didn't like that fact, mm -hmm. right? Just because you didn't make the top seven doesn't mean you're not worth helping. So I created a program. It's based on the same curriculum and the same basic format as Fledge, shrunk it down so it's affordable to run uh, as a uh, tuition-based program and then opened it up and expected three or four licensees and here we are not quite a year later and we have 16. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, it kicks a story that we, we have to get to at some point in time, but right now I've got to get to the most recent demo day. As I was watching through the video of, of demo day, I mean the very first one that came out was a very tall, broad-shouldered Eastern European man who was talking about freedom of speech. Yeah. Well, That's right. a business? Uh, I think it's a business. He, think, he certainly thinks it's a business. Um, so he's a millennial, 23-year-old from Georgia, Republic of. Mm -hmm. um, he and his co-founder, who, who were uh, childhood friends, uh, they grew up in a, just be clear, they were born in the Soviet Union. Right? They're just oh, old yes. enough that they're born in the Soviet Union. They mm -hmm. live in, in the Free Republic of Georgia at the moment uh, without moving. Uh, and free speech is something that they think about and dream of, right? They don't quite have the same free speech we have. At the same time, they're millennials, which means they're on social media. And so the basic idea is, why don't we take social media out to the streets? Why don't we take the movement of digital billboards, and instead of just making those ads, let's put up meaningful messages on them that the, that the people create. Uh, and then, you know, because of that, maybe the billboards will actually get looked at. Well, it's that ignored. Lenin is turning over in his grave, right? <laughs> That's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but some of the others, I mean, they were all really interesting. One of them was talking about reducing indoor air pollution. Sure. Uh, in Africa. Yeah, not exactly the first place <laughs> you would think. Um, well, there's actually a big problem in about a billion households, and that's that people cook with wood or, or uh, charcoal or biomass or, or cow dung mm -hmm. or something that burns. Mm -hmm. And they do it indoors because it rains. Uh, and it's equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Oh my gosh. Cooking is equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, and it mostly affects the women and the children. Not to mention the fact that it burns down buildings and kills a few million people a year. So we can solve that problem. We can solve it with an $8 stove that's made indigenous to the country, in this case, Ethiopia. And so we had a fledgling come through, uh, a refugee to this country who happened to accidentally create the largest cook stove company in Africa, uh, in Ethiopia. So. He came in for 10 weeks to figure out how to make that by far the biggest cook stove company, bigger than the other one I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, all within Ethiopia, uh, unfunded from outside. Wow, that's fantastic. Another really interesting one was also uh, related to Africa, I think, more so than any other uh, continent, and it was about poverty alleviation, and she had two very interesting items on her lap. One of them was a small carved wood lion, and the other thing was a basket. How is that a business? Um, yeah, it's a for-profit business doing something that the nonprofits have failed to do, which is bring people out of poverty. So she uh, is, in fact, the licensee of Kick in Kenya, came here to figure out how to make that a, a for-profit business, or how to boost the plan that she already had, to be specific. Uh, and it's really about running a tuition-based program to teach the people of Kenya, the rural people of Kenya, how to take the resources they already have. On average, they have two acres of land. On average, they have more than one animal. Right? They, have, they have stuff they can turn into a business and uh, empower them to do that, teach them how to run a for-profit business. Uh, and the basket was just an analogy or an uh, analog to show them that uh, they were in fact uh, caging themselves and then how to get rid of the cage. We only have time for one more and it's got to be the snail farm. <laughs> Tell me about okay. that. Um, really simple problem. Sometimes people just notice a hole in the market that everyone else ignores. And in this case, really simple. Uh, escargot in the United States is all imported. 99.99% of all escargot in the United States comes here inside a tin can from Europe. And so one of the things we talk about in this space is the average, the average distance from farm to table is 1,500 miles. In this case, it's 5,000 miles. Um, and yeah, it's a high-end food at the moment, but uh, it's still food. We eat millions of dollars worth of this product in the U.S and there's no American producer. The snails grow here, they're in fact uh, uh, invasive here, they're a problem here. Uh, nonetheless, we're gonna turn that into a food source and a for-profit business. So basic business, there's a demand, but there's not enough supply. Um, basic business plus, when you turn and talk to the really good chefs in, in, in this city and other cities, they don't open cans for their customers, right? So Tom Douglas here, 17 restaurants, right? Food Network chef. He doesn't serve escargot in any of his restaurants despite the French theme in some of them because he's not going to open a can. So as soon as they're fresh or vacuum sealed or um, some form where he, he, he feels comfortable that it's good, then many other restaurants will start serving as well. Wow. Clearly some of the most interesting businesses in the world are all coming from Fledge. So be sure to uh, look at the website that's on the screen. And Louis, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me.